Well, we, we don't react well to isolation. Humans, like I say, are social species. We are, in many people's view, the most social species. We've been labeled ultra social by a lot of scientists because other people just uh, are such a big part of our, our mental existence. And uh, most of our ideas about who we are and what we're capable of and what our worth is come from our interactions with other people. And that's, you know, that can't be overstated. And things like, you know, we have emotions like guilt, like embarrassment, which only exist in the context of how other people feel and re react towards us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host, Chitendra. This is a conversation with Dean Burnett. Dr. Dean Burnett is a neuroscientist, a lecturer, an author, a blogger, a podcaster, science communicator, and a comedian. He was previously employed as a psychiatry tutor and a lecturer at the Cardiff University Center for Medical Education. Dean is currently an honorary research associate at Cardiff Psychology School. In this conversation, we talk about evolution of the brain, motion sickness, sleep disorders, egotistic nature of the brains, attention, personalities, and mental illness. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Okay. Um, hi, Dean. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. Always appreciate it. So uh, as scientists, you know, we, we like so many laws and principles <laughs> in, in, our, in our field. Um, so let's start with your law, which is hmm. the Burnett Law. So what is that and how, how did you come to uh, describe it? Um, it's something I've, uh, well, I, I say it myself. No one's, no one's uh, attributed to me. It's just something I've said a lot. It's that um, if anyone in mainstream science or a mainstream media a scientist uh, uh, makes a very, very bold scientific claim, uh, but they haven't published any research about it, but they have done a TED talk, then you shouldn't really take them that seriously essentially, because it does seem to be becoming more and more of a thing uh, in recent years that you will get someone um, making uh, some sort of very, uh, very, very uh, outlandish claims about what they can do scientifically uh, to, to the mainstream media. Um, and not nothing against them. Like they, they, they just get the press release. They don't have any real part in this. And it's taken up uh, because of the people who publish news stories we rarely have scientific backgrounds, at least not enough to accurately assess the claims being made. And you know, I think a lot of, people, a lot of uh, less scrupulous types have noticed that and have uh, recognised that that's a thing. And therefore, they've, um, uh, you know, they, they say, "Well, I'll just do this press release to a friendly media site. They'll share it as is because they don't have the, the ability to assess it, and then uh, then I'll get publicity for my." my claims or like whatever it is it invariably involves making money in some shape or form but it can be just about attention but yeah generally when someone makes such a, a massive scientific claim doesn't have any published research about it but has done ted talks and media interviews then it's reasonably safe to say this isn't uh you know this isn't as scientific as you're claiming it to be anyway yes a bit long-winded but that's generally uh, that's, that's how i tend to approach these matters no it's it's great actually because Science is a great tool, but then mm. if we kind of use it carefully and uh, we know that who are who are the people claiming those uh, scientific experiments and uh, kind of talking mm. about those uh, studies, so it was it was it was good that once I kind of listened to it and I I got to know that there is something and you are basically talking about uh, the these issues as well. So mm. I was like, okay, let's start with that just to put it out there. And then we go on to your background, which is, again, a, a huge list. So you are a, a neuroscientist, mm -hmm. an author, blogger, mm -hmm. an occasional comedian. Uh, that, yeah. That'll be interesting to talk about. Yes. Yeah. And also, as you say, that you are, you are an all-round science guy. Essentially, so, yes. So, so how, how did it all start? Um, it's a very uh, sort of uh, unusual story about how I got into science because uh, a lot of people have asked me like how do you get into all this and I mean, in many ways I didn't I didn't mean to it was never like a I didn't have a solid five-year plan as to how to end up in this situation 
but uh, so I guess you know, in terms of interest in science in the first place, um, that's also quite unusual. That I'm not from a scientific background in terms of my family or my my my, my home environment. I'm from the, the South Wales uh, Valley regions in the UK, which were you know the hub of the coal industry in the uh, 1800s. And and uh, during the 80s, just after I was born, uh, the, you know, the Conservative government at the time shut down the mining industry. So it was essentially uh, it's like a remote, isolated community with no um, no focus. Like the, the whole community was built around the coal mine, which was now gone. So like you know, all the miners lost their jobs, and the whole point of the region was taken away. So it's a strange environment to grow up in. You know, it's very rural, very picturesque, and because it's such a small place, but um, yeah, not a lot going on because you know, the, the whole point of the place is no longer uh, no longer valid. So that's a sort of strange environment I grew up in. And I grew up in one of the community pubs my parents ran. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not from an academic area. I'm not from an academic background. Um, my, my parents are very much working class children of miners, um, specifically miners, is all, because that's all it was at the time. Uh, but I always liked... Um, uh, reading and like finding out things and I, I wasn't a very sporty kid and like most of my friends and family uh, I wasn't very outgoing I didn't you know I wasn't very extroverted like a lot of my family are and you know, that was weird eventually I realized that I was very different to my friends and family in, in a lot of interesting ways and I became sort of fascinated as to why I was different and eventually you know in my childish way came to the conclusion that something is different about my brain because that's what makes people do and think things. And, you know, I just sort of tried to figure out how to investigate what was up with me. Uh, but also I was a child. I had no resources to do that. But uh, it did sort of make that first link between I'm interested in stuff and to do with the brain. And I don't know, so then I think that's a very uh, original link between my interest and stuff about how the brain works. And over time, I said, well, like, I like science. I want to find out more science stuff. And then I ended up doing scientists in school. Uh, I did my A-levels, like the um, top school exams you get uh, in, in the UK. And then uh, I was told I should try to go to university. Again, I didn't really know what that was. I had no family experience. I had no, I didn't know, I didn't know anyone who'd been. But I thought, well, I'd do, like, find out what it was. I, I could do that. I think I'd be okay doing university. And, Went and got a position on the neuroscience program in Cardiff because I still had an interest and finished that. You know, got a decent uh, degree. And I kept thinking, I was thinking, no, I, I don't think, I, I think there's more to this. I think I could go further and uh, do the whole PhD thing. But I didn't want to become one of those cliches of just someone who's scared of the outside world, you know, just, just doesn't want to get a real job, just want to keep studying for as long as they can. Um, I'm not sure how real those people are, but, you know, that, that was a, a concern of mine. Based on like based on my background and upbringing, so I I thought I should find some work first and deal the world of work, and I ended up working for nearly two years in the university, but as a technician who embalmed the cadavers for the medical school. So my job involved handling dead people and helping cut them up, which, when it comes to getting your hands dirty, is like it doesn't get much dirtier than that, does it? You're actually up to your elbows in people's innards on a daily basis, so. No, I, I felt like I'd, I'd done my time then. I, thought, no, I really would like to do a PhD because this is horrible. And um, ended up applying. I got another position also in Cardiff, which is like the, my, the main neuroscience place in the area. And uh, so I was doing that and sort of became, got my doctorate that way. It's a long-winded process. I had a lot of bad luck with results and publications, as tends to be the case with a lot of people. But because of that, uh, or sort of like, not sort of because of that, but... That wasn't as bad as it could have been because obviously if you know the, the, the cliche of publish or perish like if you don't have good enough results with your name on them in the you know, in, in the literature your your perspectives or like your, your your potential career as a scientist is harmed you know if you don't have enough good stuff under your belt you you won't get the ever increasing demanded jobs and positions and you know, the the claim of the field so uh, but during the whole um cadaver embalming era um at this point uh, i'd gone through my teens i'd become more outgoing i thought i got to university i thought i don't want to be um you know i don't want to be that nervous guy anymore um I, I sort of, you know you, you rediscover yourself so i was a lot more confident than i was i'd always wanted to do stand-up comedy but never had the bravery to do it i was just too scared because 
as multiple are, you know. But um, but then I was handling dead bodies all day, every day. So what I was scared of became a lot less, you know, a lot a lot different. So I wasn't scared of doing. I thought, well, I'll give it a try. It's, a, it's better than the day job, isn't it? So I tried it. Went okay, and I sort of did a bit of sideline there. Um, then after the PhD, I was looking for work because I didn't have that many good results under my belt. And while I was doing that, I sort of discovered the concept of blogging and started up a blog. I, thought, I can write funny stuff about science. That's a, I have a very specific skill set for that. Um, it's not unique, but it's rare. You know, so I started doing that. And uh, my personal blog, where I tried to make funny things about science, started taking off, which I was happy about. And then I got sort of uh, invited to do a one-off piece for The Guardian, the UK website, it's a very popular news platform. That went well. And then I ended up being added to the... Um, uh, the list of regular bloggers. So I had a regular blog on the, the Guardian News uh, site and that became really popular to the point where a literary agent just emailed me out the blue saying, your stuff's really popular. I like it. You ever thought about doing a book? And as I tell people, I had thought about it, but you know, I'd also thought about owning a jetpack or going to Mars. It's, it's, that'd be nice. Never going to happen. Let's never, let's not, <laughs> let's, let's not waste anyone's time by, uh, by pursuing it. But anyway, it turns out that the, there was interest in what I was writing. So Put together a pitch for him, took in some publishers. One of them said, yeah, that sounds good, and published the first book. And my assumption was that you know, because I wasn't a famous scientist or uh, you know, someone really high, big hitter in the field, and I thought that you, those are the only people who were allowed to write science books. I mean, I, I know I was naive, but in hindsight, I, um, that's what I thought. So I thought, well, if I'm doing one, this Mr. Nobody here, um, best case scenario, they'll publish it, it'll be on the shelves for a while. Over time, people will read my blog, might buy some copies, and eventually it'll break even so they don't lose any money, and then we'll never speak of it again. I assume that's what would happen. Um, it didn't. Like the first book has, um, <laughs> went so well, I'm starting to be like, like they're on podcasts in other countries like <laughs> six years later. So, um, uh, so yeah, so that, that's, and you know, again, once that takes, takes off, it, my career went in a whole different direction. So now I'm a full-time author and writer, which um, which I'm better suited to. Like, I, I, I probably I, I probably made it clear I was never the best neuroscientist. I just had a knack for talking about it. So um, they should probably leave it to the people who are good at it, and I'll, I'll just tell other people what what they're what they're up to. And I'm quite happy with that um, that, that position <laughs> that I'm in. <laughs> yeah, you said it's a, it's an unusual journey, but I think this is a, a kind of a fantastic journey for for a scientist to become also an author mm. and uh, and and to communicate science to bring science for people so that they can understand and <clears throat> like i i could i could kind of understand the evolution of uh, you know those phases and mm. when we are talking about evolution let's start with the evolution of the brain itself you know as anything else in biology brains are also a product of evolution mm -hmm. So uh, what is the evolutionary function of, of the brains? Um, well, it's uh, like it, the brain does so much stuff. There's so much happening in the typical human brain that, you know, it's, we're talking hundreds of billions of neurons with trillions of connections and even more signals being bounced back and forth all the time. So, I mean, to assign one specific function to the brain is you, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. It just does too much stuff. And, I know there's still lots of unanswered questions as in like how does all these different like electrochemical signals combine to make one unified consciousness um we don't know like that's 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 one of the, for the philosophers even so like we don't know how you get from a to b in that respect so in terms of like what it's for i mean i think there's there's a myth that goes around that um you know still is still in due to this day uh <clears throat> you know, we only use 10 percent of our brain and that is completely wrong, but in two different ways. Uh, because if you think of it in terms of, you know, our brain is just sat there and we can switch bits of it on deliberately, we can't actually activate 10% of our brain at once. I mean, because of the way the, the brain's blood vessels are arranged and the, the ability of the body to supply extra nutrients and minerals and reserves and supplies to the brain to do activity is kind of restricted. So we can only sort of, um, enhance or like activate two to three percent of our brain at once which is why multitasking is hard because you know your brain only has limited resources okay so they got to go here now oh no wait they got it i mean they're over here no no they got to come back over here you can't keep everything going at once you got to sort of allocate um so we can't use we can't enhance 10 percent of our brain any one time 
But the idea that we only use 10% of our brain and there's like this 90% mass which doesn't do anything or doesn't do anything that we can recognize, that's, that's ridiculous because evolution doesn't work like that. Evolution is, amongst other things, brutally um, efficient because it, you know, if, we, if we didn't need that 90% of our brain, we wouldn't have it. The evolution doesn't just allow for such things like that because it's um, it's fairly ruthless. You know, like because also because the brain is so demanding, it's so hungry as an organ. It uses up some like twenty percent of our body's reserves, uh, energy reserves, and sort of nutrients just by sitting there, so living. Because like brain activity is incredibly biologically demanding. Um, it's resource hungry. So the idea we would have ninety percent of our brain just sat there taking up resources and doing nothing. Um, I mean, in evolutionary terms, then if some sort of rival human was born uh, with only the 10% of their brain, they would survive. They would be the dominant species because they don't have this 90% gray matter just dragging them down, like taking up all their resources. So yeah, we use all of our brain. All of our brain has a function, as a purpose. And you know, I think when you say, what's the brain for? I mean, we're sort of uh, getting into kind of philosophical territory again that what what is life for what is anything for but in terms of like oh, the brain is is us it's our it's the seat of who we are what we are and how we interact with the world it allows us to function independently it makes decisions for us it directs our body it uh, stores all the information we need in order to survive and it's constantly reshaping and tweaking itself and you know it's it's the brain allows us to exist it allows us to engage the world and to uh, to become independent, autonomous individuals. And that's, you know, it's a big achievement in many ways. And, but the human brain in particular has the ability to simulate, to rationalize, to predict and plan and create intangible information from, you know, from nothing essentially. And that's right, where we have the advantage a lot of the time. So yeah, the brain does a lot of things in the evolutionary sense. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And um, the the other th important thing here is the reptilian brain itself, that mm. or this term as it called reptilian brain. Uh, so, what is it, and do we still have it? Yeah, the the reptile brain uh, is again it's a phrase that comes up a lot. You hear it. It's the you know it's a sort of generic mainstream term for the most fundamental parts of the brain, which is like the, your brain stem, uh, maybe the cerebellum in there, the midbrain, things like that the oldest parts of the brain that sort of remain relatively unchanged since the time of the dinosaurs, which I think is where the reptile thing comes from, because like we see reptiles as more primitive, older species, uh, but they have these brain bits too. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like the housekeeping part of the brain, the part which does the essential keeping you alive stuff, like heart beats and blood vessels and uh, breathing and you know, things like that or like handling food and digestion so it's all it's, it's the essential stuff um the very basic stuff your brain needs in order to for you to survive more than one second at a time and so you know, that's a lot of species like, like reptiles perhaps to have that and not much else you know, they can make it for memories and things but um you know they, they, they rely on this i mean that, that is enough for a species to to survive with you know as long as it keeps you it just keeps you alive and keeps you moving keeps you interacting with the environment that's 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 enough you know like the, some of the sort of deep sea creatures and like the slugs and stuff they they can make they can get by in two hundred thousand neurons which just do that nothing else but we obviously move beyond that so out of the reptile brain in a lot of species um sometimes we call it the the, the animal brain but sometimes people call it specifically the mammal brain it's like a like a mushroom came out of the reptile brain the next stage of evolution um was the more complex stuff still kind of fundamental but more um you know more, more rich and complex than just basic survival so things like emotions things like uh, complex memories um uh, you know, pleasure and pain responses learning that you know if i do this i get a good thing i'll keep doing that like these things like in the midbrain uh it's often called the limbic system uh it's an old label it doesn't really apply anymore because we know it's not so clearly divided but it's still like a a useful rule of thumb. The limbic system is stuff that happens below the conscious brain, uh, but it's still complex. It does like emotion is normally connected with but that. That encompasses um, uh, memory and um, you know perceptions, sensory things like that. And uh, so that's like the middle bit. So we've got the reptile at the bottom, midbrain, limbic, animal brain. At the top, we have the neocortex, the big 
curly, like you know, big, uh, knobbly bit on top that we see, um, as we recognize as the brain, like the, the boxing glove shape, you know, sort of curled, you know, spiky, you know what a brain looks like. This is <laughs> they're not unfamiliar objects, and um, but yeah, that's so that, that's uh, a lot of creatures have that, but neo means new, new, new cortex, and that part in humans sort of like ballooned, uh, got really, really big, really, really quickly uh, in the sort of space of a couple of million years, which sounds like a long time and is, but in evolutionary terms, it was a very, very rapid. And that's where all the, uh, the, the good stuff happened, like a very complex sensory processing, language centers. Um, front of the brain is particularly important for really complex things like uh, um, short-term memory access, uh, abstract reasoning, self-control, self-awareness, uh, image perception, and so on and so on. So out of that uh, you know, grew the, the the neocortex, which is like the, in humans, particularly it's the most powerful and most complex as far as you can see. And you know, so we have sort of three, they're not distinct, but they are like, sort of, you can divide them up into three levels. And a lot of, uh, I think I mentioned in the book, but a, a lot of modern day problems we have in life, just by, you know, just you know, things which we do, we don't realize why they happen. And we don't, I know, why did I do that? Or what's going on there? Like, oh God, why, why does my head keep doing that? A lot of that comes from this arrangement because you have brand new, uh, you know, complex abilities, complex abilities interfacing with very old reflexes and emotions and instincts. And they get in each other's way and they sort of trip each other up. And sometimes they don't make any sense. Like you can, like the way you can, you can, as a human, you can predict and rationalize that, oh, a bad thing will happen. So if the economy keeps going like this, I will lose my job. I will be uh, unable to afford my rent. I'll have to move somewhere cheaper. And that's going to be a stress and it's going to impact my career and my, my social life. And so you can, you can predict all this, you know, but it hasn't happened. It may never happen, but it's something that's just solely in your head. But because that's, that exists in your brain, it sort of stimulates the, the midbrain, the emotional centers, and you get stressed and you get the same reaction you would do if something dangerous is right in front of you. So because like those deeper parts of your brain, they don't recognize the difference between actual genuine threats right in front of you and potential imagined threats, which you know, will occur in many years or maybe never. And therefore we get, you know, we, modern life is stressful because we can, you know, the human brain is a victim of his own success like that because you've got this ability to predict the future combined with this you know, no-nonsense, tangible fear response, which leads to stress and things like that because it doesn't have the, the wherewithal to tell the difference. And that's just one example of how the different layers of the brain can interact in, in helpful ways because like evolution may be ruthless, but it's not necessarily the most efficient or like, uh, smart. It's just like, this works, let's go with it. And they haven't died yet. Let's just keep it like that for now then until something else comes along. Yeah, so that's what basically we are going to talk about. So, so first of all, the reptilian brain is a reptile onwards. It's, it's a structure, a primitive structure, which all the animals uh, we, we share. But it's mm -hmm. not like that. It's some isolated part of the brain which is working alone. Of course, there are uh, oh. th there is another part which, as you call it, a balloon, um, a neocortex, uh, which is I mean, because it's also something about metaphors, right? I mean, we use reptilian mm. brain, but that doesn't mean that it's working in isolation. Everything is connected. It yes. just that now we have something additional which we call neocortex, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like I mean, I, I think any effort to uh, separate the brain into clear sections is always going to be, you know, fairly limited use because one of the main powers of the brain is like pretty much everything is connected to everything else. And while it makes it hard to study, it's good. Like, you know, everything can influence everything else. So we have so much overlap. And so you know, the boundaries between what bit does what are very blurred and some bits do several different things and you know, what you need them to do depends on the context and stuff. So, so yeah, so it's a, yeah, the reptile brain is like just a catch-all term for the oldest parts of the brain, which are still essential, very essential, uh, but they're sort of fundamental. Uh, you know, without them, you can't do anything. But once you've got them, you can you, know, you move on with it. And yeah, so you need them, but you also need you know, the, the higher powers to be able to exist as modern human. So yeah, but the, a lot of issues come from that. 
So, um, so that means the issues which happen in our modern life, this can be different things that we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the uh, motion sickness, or mm -hmm. it can be hallucinations, etc. you know, that so these kind of issues, they, they happen because of the conflicts between new part of the brain and the old part of the brain? Is it is it true? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of cases that will happen. Like I said, the, the stress thing is because your new forward seeking, like your ext extrapolation powers are interacting with the old fear response uh, and you know, you're getting a tangible reaction for something which isn't tangible. Uh, but actually you mentioned the motion sickness, that's the one which people bring up a lot in that it's when, you know, because because we're, we're modern day humans, we have the brain power and we had the brain power to invent transport, to invent artificial conveyance, cars, ships, airplanes, or even, or even like taming a horse, perhaps. Um, so no, we, we had the brain power to do that. But you know, artificial transport is only like a few thousand years old in terms of human culture. And when, 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 when you think of the wheel, that goes into what, tens of thousands of years ago. But that's still a very short space of time in the evolutionary sense. So, so like the, the structure of the brain hasn't really had time to evolve into a form which takes artificial transport into account. And therefore, when you're, when you're riding a vehicle, um, it, it's an interesting and unusual thing for your basic brain to dig in. So and what happens is you, your senses become mismatched. Uh, so you've got like, in years, you've got the balance sensors, the, the vestibular system full of fluid, and the movement of that fluid tells your brain and body Okay, so what's happening to us right now? Are we going up and down? Are we going left and right? We're, you know, we're moving forward. Okay, so I'm just, it's just telling me where I am in space, essentially. And uh, by contrast, like when you're on a vehicle, like you're sitting, you're sitting down, staying straight ahead, your eyes are saying we're not moving because there's no, there's no, there's no visual stimulation saying you're moving, especially like in an airplane or something, because there's no landmarks to see you go past, other than very, very slowly. And that's. Um, potentially uh, confusing. So the brain's got your eyes uh, telling you that you're not moving and the balance system telling you you are moving. And because of you know, it's such a fundamental reaction, it's the older, deeper parts of the brain which have to deal with this, uh, the sensory mismatch, like in the thalamus. So your brain's going, I've got mismatched senses here. That's That can't happen. You know, I can't get two conflicting signals because there's no way that can be, like, you can't be both moving and not moving at the same time. So the senses are confused. And because the way we've evolved, the, the, those parts of the brain like only have one response is it was senses mismatch. That must mean we're hallucinating, which means we've been poisoned. So got to get rid of the poison. And so like, you got to be sick, you got to throw up. And that's like the only thing that your, 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 your fundamental brain knows to do. So like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what's caused this problem, but the only thing I can think of is you've been intoxicated by something bad. So get rid of it. Maybe that'll fix it. And therefore you get travel sickness because people have like sort of, you know, your senses are not lining up and your brain's going, oh, that's not good. Let's just vomit in case it's you've eaten something dodgy. So yeah, so like it's the higher part of the brain and the lower part of the brain, once again, not getting on or not communicating effectively. And uh, you know, it doesn't happen to everyone. Some people have a better way of talking, you know, better integration between the two separate systems or they just learn better things. But um, yeah, that's why it's such a common, uh, common occurrence. So because part of our brain gets overwhelmed with, with the si signals that it is receiving? Um, yeah, it's, it's not so much overwhelmed, it's just that it recognizes that the two sensory feeds it's getting, the two sensory streams mm -hmm. of information, they, they don't match up. Because mostly our senses are in complete agreement. Okay, so mm -hmm. I'm going this way, like I feel my hand, there's my hand, yep, see, I hear it. And, um, and I could say, you could feel you, your body knows where it is and stuff. But um, when you travel in, those parts of your brain which integrate all these all the sensory information are very deep and fundamental, and they realize, oh, these two things are incompatible. These don't, these don't merge. These like moving, not moving, moving, not moving. They can't, you know, they can't coexist. There's a problem here, and it's a problem in the senses. And like okay, in, in evolution, the only thing that our brain has recognized, our fundamental brain has recognized that can do that is when we're being poisoned, which can affect our internal system. So when so I got a sensory mismatch, I got two incompatible streams of data, that must be poison. So you better throw up to get rid of it, otherwise you'll be damaged. So yeah, so you're not sort of overwhelmed, just the brain getting confused and having no options uh, to, to, to uh, no, no other options of what to do about it. 
Yeah. And uh, for the brains and also for the individuals, like for the organisms, it'll be very, very important to kind of learn that behavior to not repeat it, for example. Right. So mm. how important that learning part is then? Like, yes, that's, that's a big fundamental part. I mean, there's lots of different um, means of learning uh, for the human brain in particular, because you know, in, in most you know, basic straightforward creatures there's always the conditioning thing as in when okay i hear the sound got a zap i will learn that like that sound means bad so I, I will tense up whenever that sound happens or i'll recoil from it if i hear it and you know, it's it's like the a to b to c like the brain forms new connections which allow this to happen and that's like the most basic sort, sort of uh, neurological learning that we recognize like the conditioning or things like habituation so like when you keep sort of getting the same stimulation and you react to it and then it happens again and nothing happens and you, you stop reacting to it slowly because your brain learns okay every time i hear that sound nothing happens so i'm going to not react to it anymore because i don't need to that's just a waste of time and resources for everyone and like that's, that's at the most basic level but because we're humans we have uh, the ability to simulate and extrapolate we can learn by observation you can see other people doing something like this. You see them press a button and a spike comes up and takes their arm off. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to press that button because it didn't happen to me, but I can see what happened to that other guy when he's pressed it. And I'm, I, I was, you know, I'm, that's a very visceral bit of information. So we can learn by observation and we can learn by, uh, you know, extrapolation. And that's very helpful. Um, there's some like arguments that things like uh, teenage crushes, you know, when you're obsessed with someone, particularly during your teenage years, and it's sort of like you know, the whole posters on the wall thing or doodling their name absentmindedly or just like having desperate dreams and fantasies about them. It can be very distracting. It can be sort of uh, upsetting in some ways because there's no, they don't reciprocate. But it's believed to be a useful thing because it helps your brain learn how to deal with romantic, romantic uh, relationships without having to do trial and error. Because if you're like you're 14 and you keep having different partners all the time, that's you know, that, that is, that's a recipe for disaster. So if you just have a crush and although it's not real, your brain is going right, okay, if I do this, then that, okay, I'm going to practice this. It's, 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 it's practicing. It's like going to the gym and using the treadmill. You're not going anywhere, but it is good for you. And that's you know, a big part of that as well. But yes, the, the things we learn shape how we react to things because like, they inform our model of understanding of how the world works so if something was to challenge that understanding then we would react to it potentially positively because we want to know more or negatively because we don't like having our existing worldview changed in any way because it's, you know, it's a lot of time and effort and it, it makes our existing ideas wrong but yeah so the things you've learned the things you've learned and uh, have experienced in your life which form which have formed what you who you are uh, the brain keeps hold of all that. And then that can very easily uh, dictate how you react to other things or how you perceive things because the, the, you've got your own unique understanding of how the world works and everything you experience will fit into that or not in some shape or form. And the reaction part is uh, really interesting. So this reaction, so first of all, I mean, we maybe we can also define a little bit about the plasticity that the brain is this this kind of plastic in plastic nature means like it can it is forming these new neural networks with the time with new experiences and the reaction which is basically this fight or flight system mm. that comes from this plasticity right yes you know the, I suppose that the brain sort of key powers and that it's very plastic it's very flexible it can change it can form new connections when it learns something new and the formation of a connection is how the brain stores information as far as everything we've seen shows us. And that's, you know, that's how the brain operates. That's how it does anything. But because uh, pardon me, we're constantly taking in things all the time and the world around us is regularly changing, pardon me again, the, uh, our brains adapt with it. So like, you know, we learn something new is okay. I, that what I thought was the case is no longer the case. So I don't need the old connection. I need the new one or the old memory. I need the new one. So my memories can be changed, and updated. It's like human memory is a lot more flexible than we give it credit for, which is, it does cause a lot of problems for things like uh, court cases which involve eyewitnesses because people may genuinely think they remember something which they didn't experience. It's, you know, it's, it's possible. It can happen. Things like false memories, but even just 
certain details and they can be quite vivid in your head, but they, that isn't how they occurred. Because memories are constantly being updated or added to, because the brain doesn't form a brand new memory every time you encounter the same thing again and again, and it just updates the old one uh, just to save resources and you know, capacity. So yeah, the plasticity of the brain does determine how you perceive and understand things, but say, your reactions can change over time as well. So if at first you really don't like something, you can, uh, you know, you will probably have that, that reaction of, no, I don't want to don't don't hear that. I don't want to go near it. I don't want to eat it. I don't want to know what it is. But, you know, if you learn new things, uh, you know, your, your understanding of how the world alters, then your reactions to that same thing might also alter too. It's like you might find, you might think someone is like an unpleasant person to be around. And uh, like, oh, I, I hate that person. They're just annoying and really in your face. And then you find out that, you know, they're actually, they're not actually like that. I was, they were acting or something, or they were doing a, a thing for a role. You like, oh, that's actually quite cool. I don't know, I respect them for that. They convinced me. And so that you, your reaction to them will change to the same person, but you know, you're in, you've got more context. You've got a better understanding of the situation and your reactions will um, update accordingly. So you know, I think it's called appraisal theory, whereby we react to things emotionally, but our brain also logs the reaction we had and the consequences of that. And then it'll take that into account next time we react, we encounter the thing. So like last time I encountered this person, I said, I was really angry at them. And I said, no, don't know. I, I tried to get rid of them. And people didn't like that because this is a popular person. So I must be missing something. And no, I won't react like that next time. I'll take into, take into account. So the brain is constantly updating our reactions and responses to things like that as well, because it's, you know, because everything around us is dynamic and we try to keep on top of that. But then why these kind of false or uh, modified memories? Um, there's a lot of reasons for that because, you know, you, there's no sort of you know, hard and fast rule as to what you should have in your memory anyway, but uh, it's, it's very hard to, well, very hard, but it's harder for the brain to take in abstract, intangible information because it hasn't evolved to do that. Like our ability to just uh, read words on a page or hear numbers and remember them is relatively new in terms of the evolutionary sense of things. So whereas most things, uh, for most of our history, emotion has been like the main uh, driver behind what memories are deemed as important. This was a very emotional experience. I'll remember that. Uh, that'll stay in memory forever because most all the emotional parts of the brain get involved in forming the memory. And that still happens. You know, so everyone will probably agree that your most powerful memories are your most emotional ones, like you know, the, the heartbreaks or the, the brilliant things or the great experiences or the sadness. And but you, you remember these things quite clearly because they were that heavy emotional element. Uh, but when you know, our memory is laid down, like I say it's not laid down as like one file in a computer hard drive. It's a sort of it's a combination of different aspects already in your memory or laid down or different units. And that's one theory as to why dreaming is so weird, because dreaming is believed to be the uh, the brain sort of taking stock at the end of the day uh, when you're unconscious, sort of re reworking and processing all your new memories linked up to old ones or dealing with troublesome ones. Because, and it takes all it takes all the elements apart and like puts them together in different ways to try and connect them to other things. Hence, dreams are both familiar and very strange because it's all things from your memory being jumbled up and put into very unpredictable and seemingly random orders. But what it means is that your memories are constantly being updated and changed and tweaked, and you can add things to them and take things away from them. Uh, so like it's happened to me a few times that my wife and I will uh, discuss uh, something that happened to her. And she's um, you know, told the story to other friends. And I've been there and stuff. And over time, it's gotten to the point where I'm sort of tell the story as if I was there, as if I was experiencing it. But it's not, it's her story, but I've heard it so many times. It's in my head now as a personal memory because I have, I know my wife, obviously better than anyone. Uh, I know her life and her situation. I can easily envisage the thing that happened to her. You know, it's something I'm familiar with. And I've heard the story so often, like my memory of it has been added to and embellished over time, the point where sometimes now I just put myself in it. And when you do comedy as well, that's a big part of that. Because like, if you see anyone doing sound of comedy, they are telling a story, but it's not just a straightforward story. It's obviously refined for maximum humor. And what comedians will do, they'll put like two or three separate incidents together. Uh, it would be funny if there's all one incident and tell the story as if it were happening to them, you know, 
in that particular order. Uh, but then they told that story. And then they remember telling that story, that version of events, and that'll be in their memory too. And the next time they're asked about that particular event, the, the brain will cough up the more recent memory, which is this new concoction, this combination of other things. But they'll probably remember it as, as if it actually happened that way, or at least the part of their brain will. So yeah, the brain's constantly taking and updating and reworking and modifying memories to keep on top of things. But because of that, it's very easy to end up in a situation where you have a memory in your head which didn't actually happen. Uh, you know, it depends what the influence is, depends what if there's someone telling you things or, uh, you know, if, even things like loaded questions. Like it's very important when you have eyewitnesses to not load the question. So I think I mentioned the book, like if you have a witness, you say like, um, were you in the shop at the time of the crime? And they'll say, oh, yes or no, I don't remember that. But if you say, where in the shop were you? That then means like they told that you were in the shop, you were there, you were at the scene, just which bit were you in? And that's like, um, you know, if, if, especially a court situation where there's a lot of pressure and a lot of tension and people with authority, they, people start questioning their own memories. Say, oh, was I there? I, I guess I must have been. You wouldn't be telling me that otherwise. So I think, oh yeah, I must have been in, in the corner by the, by the cash register, or whatever it was. So people will start remembering things uh, because they're told that they should remember them and they'll, your brain will fill in the gaps essentially. Um, yeah, but there's, there's even disorders where that happens. Like I said, uh, Wernicke's uh, syndrome, where Wernicke Koskoff syndrome, where people can't lay down new memories or they can't recall um, old memories either. But what they can do is they, they so they look at, so they ask them a question like, so uh, what, what's your name? What do you do? And they look around the room and they'll create uh, a, a, a history from just what they can see. So, like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, 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 a coat maker and like I, I put up windows and I am um, yeah I'm from a place with a lot of grass you know, they'll just create this fiction and they'll genuinely believe it because they don't realize it's their brain just scrabbling for information so yeah so there's lots of ways in which the memory system can be um, uh, tweaked or modified or just end, accidentally end up producing false or like unreal information I think the uh, the interesting part of this uh, modifying uh, memory part is the egotistic brain, or like you you talk mm. ab about this thing in the in the book as well. So the point is, what is this ego part in this kind of uh, when we are talking in terms of brain, um, and what would be the evolutionary uh, kind of function of um, th this? egoing-based um, modification of memories. Yeah, that's a big part of it. A lot of the, uh, the cognitive uh, processes which end up changing our memories, like you say, are heavily influenced by ego, egocentric. Um, so basically, it puts, puts ourselves in the center of the whole the situation, the experience. And a lot of the time that'll happen just by default because despite those, you know, how empathetic we can be, despite how you know, we can handle and track information, everything we see and experience and encounter is encountered and experienced from our own perspective. You know, we, can only, we can only see what's going on in our head. We can only see by our own senses. So every memory we have, we, we will be the central player because we only have our own head to, to access. So part of that would just be like, just, just happen like that anyway. But yeah, there are lots of ways in which the brain tweaks memories to make us make us seem better than we were. So if you're in a situation where there's like five of you and um, you know you decide to go to a restaurant just randomly, oh, that one will do, that's, you know, let's go that one. And you have a nice time. You've, there's a good chance that you remember back that uh, you made the decision. It's like, oh yeah, I, I knew that was a good place. I thought I'd, I'd coax everyone to do it. Or you have a job interview and it you know, doesn't go well, but you remember it going a lot well than it did because you only remember the good things that you did or what, what you felt were the positive stuff and anything you made, any mistakes you made, you're not aware of, so the brain won't, won't save that. And there's also um, a gradual process called uh, the fading affect bias, whereby negative memories uh, fade faster than positive ones in the emotional sense. So you have a memory for a very positive emotional experience, a very good experience, and I can 10, 20 years time, that'll still be a nice memory. So oh, I remember that, that was nice. It'll still have the same emotional impact. Whereas a negative experience will fade faster, like, like a flavor and chewing gum in a couple of years. You think, oh, that wasn't great, but no, it's fine. It, the memory won't trigger the same emotion anymore. 
So you end up with you know, a strong bias towards the good stuff you did in your memory, as opposed to the bad stuff. Um, so there's that as well. And um, yeah, you know, you will just you, know, you just uh, tend to re-emphasize your own role in a, events and affairs. As to why this happens, um, a lot of it's to do with just um, motivation or like general ability to function. Because at heart, uh, however rational or logical it may not be, in some cases, we all like to think we are good and functional and competent people who you know who have to who can make decisions about things. Now, when that stops happening, when you stop thinking that way yourself, that's usually when the depression is kicking in. Isn't it? Like you, you feel this, you lose a sense of self worth, this sense of uh, having any sort of valid contribution to make to the world around you. And it's really, it's really debilitating to not be able to think, I can do this, I can do that, I, I'm capable of, of existing. And you know, having this egocentric bias in our memories keeps us thinking, no, well, of course we can do this. Look, I remember lots of times I've done this before. I am a competent person. I, I, I can be trusted with decisions. I can uh, you know, pursue this course of action because I know that I'm capable of doing it. And you need that. You need that in order to be able to do anything. If you never, if you didn't think you, you were good at anything, you wouldn't do anything probably unless you're forced to. And that's all a whole other different thing. So this egocentric bias gives us the confidence um, we need to interact with the world and the people in it, because otherwise we'd have like no good opinion of ourselves, and that would make us uh, <clears throat> just make us less functional as as humans and uh, as a species and a society. So yeah, it, it does have. It can be very annoying when you encounter someone with a too strong egocentric bias who thinks they're brilliant and you clearly tell they're not. But at heart, it has a, an evolutionary purpose. This is this is really good stuff, basically, yeah. because if so, so what we are uh, so what you are saying here is the um, so we put ourselves like at the center of the universe, and we basically need this uh, to function properly and if we don't have it we kind of start to self-doubt and that kind of also leads to uh, mental disorders uh, like depression right yeah pretty much i mean it can vary i mean there are some cultures which are different like obviously i'm from the uk and europe and stuff which is a far more um individualistic culture like we we prioritize the individual on the contribution they make to society uh, and just like the american does as well and a lot of um, you know Indo-European countries, but some cultures like sort of like China or um, the India and stuff, or like the, the tribal cultures, they're a bit more community-minded. So they prioritize like the, the, the community of the people around them. Um, so it depends how you develop in the context. But yes, even then, you still need that. You know, if you still think the community is more important than you, you still need to think that you're a valuable contributor to it. So yeah, see, so, you know, this egocentric bias in our memory makes us feel like we are worthwhile. Makes us feel that we are, um, you know, we, we are we are we are worth worthy of survival. We are worthy of consideration, and other people will like us. So we are, you know, we feel okay with interacting with them. Um, so yeah, again, when when you don't have that, when that's taken away from you for whatever reason, by traumatic events or just by bad luck with your genetics or whatever it happens to be you lose this ability to think I am good. I am worthwhile. Um, yeah, that's you know, both a cause and a result of things like depression, because you lose the motivation, you lose the connection between your actions and the workings of the world around you. Cause you think, well, like nothing I do makes a difference. Nothing I do is any value. Why would I get out of bed? Why would I you know, work a nine to five to put money on the table? I, I don't, I don't have any purpose. I don't need to exist. And that's when you become, Sort of debilitatingly uh, sad or just just blank because you do you, your brain loses that connection between what you do and what what value you have to the world around you, and again we really do need that as in order to function. Our current evaluation systems basically they work on um, on on this kind of uh, like to to evaluate your output basically, right? So does this mean that most of the people that they end up in this higher positions, they make a lot of, or they say a lot of nonsense, or I don't know that they have these kind of more egotistic memories? Yeah, there's gonna be a big part of that in that you know, if you're someone higher up in society, a very, very wealthy person or someone who has got a lot of authority over others, it, um, and a lot of it will do, how did you get there in the first place? Like sometimes it'll be someone who's worked their way up um, via hard work, which is fair enough. But 
to do that, they might have had to you know, step on a lot of people and you know, throw people under the bus, so like harm other people's progress and chances on the way. So they obviously have like a less um, uh, a less empathetic outlook of other people. They uh, they're, they're far more concerned with themselves, like egocentric than the norm, which is you know it's not good. It's, not, it's often like it means disharmony in the culture and stuff. But for you personally, it can be very beneficial to be able to to be willing to. You know, do people over or to compromise other people's situations and chances for, for your own sake. Um, but also some people who are you know, very high up in society, they have born to that connection. Like they're born into the part of the society, which is uh, very well connected, very wealthy, very, um, you know, very established in the, the ruling classes, whatever you want to call it. And they don't know any different. Like they, they've never experienced like uh, things like poverty or having to work hard in order to, to get to where you are and things like that. And they've told about it. They, and they think they do perhaps in many cases, but they haven't experienced the the proper, you know, how life works for most people. Uh, but because of their position, because of the way the society is set up, they end up being in charge of things anyway. So they make decisions based on their own experiences, which are uh, far less, you know, um, uh, encompassing of your average person's uh, life. So you have like, powerful politicians who are very, very wealthy and always have been. And they say, oh, we'll just lower taxes on these companies because that's what what everyone cares about. No, no, that's what you care about. Other people need support and help, but um, that's not their world. They've never experienced that. And like they only have this small bubble of similar-minded people who care about these things. And because over time, like that's the people who've been put in charge of stuff, then you get this this disharmony between the people at the top, what they decide, the people everyone else who doesn't get a say uh, but has a very different life to them and it is you know, the, the brain can only work with what it's got and if you've never experienced hardships and poverty or just you know uh, money worries and like that you can sort of you can technically theorize what that would be like but you can never say you've directly experienced it and that'll mean it's has less influence on you you won't con- you won't consider that aspect of life so much because it's not part of yours so it won't factor that much in your decision making. I mean, I know I said earlier on things like adolescent crushes, they help your brain practice these things, but you know, practice doesn't, you know, you have to you have to do it for real eventually. And you know, even if someone is like very, very wealthy and does genuinely want to help poorer people, they can still end up making less helpful decisions because they don't have the the life experiences to inform them. It's like, well, I can do this to help people. Yes, but that, people don't want that, they want this. And you would have known that. If you had the relevant experience, which would show you that back in back in the early part when you were still developing, so yeah, there's lots of reasons why you know, people high up in society um, maybe that they are too egocentric. You know, they care more about their own agenda, their own power than anyone else's. But it's you no, know, a lot of it will be because they've lived a life where that's not been discouraged, or that's not been an, that's not been a bad thing for them it's like it's expected so yeah we have different parts of society which have different rules and different expectations and different influences and that's how we end up where we are today really and then this egocentric view itself would be um, also related to kind of conspiracy theories basically because the fact that you know certain people they can have these kind of bold ideas just putting mm. themselves at the center and um, maybe f- not thoroughly checked with the literature, uh, etc., and then you know, which ends up in a in in these kind of concepts, which we call conspiracy <clears throat> theories, right? Yeah, that, that's a big part of that. I mean, lots of things feed into uh, how conspiracy theories establish and exist in the first place. I mean, one of them is going to be uh, one thing that stresses the human brain out is uncertainty. The idea of random things happening with no pattern or no uh, reason behind them. Uh, which, which is how the universe works, you know, there's, there's no one in charge, really, but our brains don't like that, they, they need to have a cause and effect, they need to have fairness, because that's how we've evolved. So when you have something bad happens, uh, you get a bad thing, and you know, you can either say, that's just pure coincidence, or just pure chance that a bad thing happened, which in most cases is correct, but our brains just don't like that normally, they're like, no, no, like, things like that can't just happen, because that means things like that could happen to me and I, I'm important because of my egocentric worldview. Uh, but also, you know, the idea that someone is in charge is uh, or responsible for this is far more reassuring because 
they go, oh, no, no, that won't happen to me because I've, I recognize who does that and what, you know, why they're doing it, which is part of it. But, um, you know, so having an explanation for unexplained events is very reassuring. And if it's a conspiracy, that still applies. But the reason like they endure, become so pervasive is because if you genuinely believe a conspiracy theory, it's that, you know, something is being hidden from everyone else in society, but you figured it out. It's you. you. You're the one with the secret knowledge or you're the one with the superior understanding of the situation. And that makes you feel good. That makes you feel better than other people. So our egocentric uh, desires are fed in that respect. So like, oh, yes, I, I win because I figured this out. You guys didn't. I, I'm, I'm better than you. And that gives us a nice warm feeling and stuff. And then other people who feel similar to you yeah, see, you're, you're right. That's correct. I believe this too. And then that makes you feel better again because you've convinced other people, they've praised you. Things which feed our ego, they tend to be very, um, you know, very intoxicating in many senses. And it's particularly why like people who believe in conspiracy theories tend to be um, more like, you know, less typical member of society, more like outcasts or feel like excluded uh, from the, the wider world for whatever reason you know it could be you know, sort of personal in inclinations or it could be just like bad luck or they're just not really going to socialize in or they've had bad experiences and stuff but when they find a conspiracy theory they can then feel like ah i belong to this community now of people who agree with this and also i'm better than the people who have rejected me and therefore like our ego is fed twice over uh, by a belief in a conspiracy theory so yes there is going to be a big element of ego and egocentricity in um, you know, the support of conspiracy theories. So in terms of brain function, it seems like, you know, that let's say that if brain is an al algorithm or there is uh, an al algorithm uh, working at the background. So it seems like that, you know, it is trying to fit the data perfectly just to mm. suit kind of um, the, the understanding that we have, right? Mm. Yeah, we have, like I said, we have this, um, mental model of how the world works and the things we encounter and experience either have to fit in that or um, if they don't then we have to expand our world understanding to accommodate it or we have to find some reason to reject it and that's not always the best approach but it is the easiest one for our brain because especially if you're older as well you've spent a lot of time your brain's spent a lot of time and effort and you absorb so many memories which leads to the creation of this world view, this model of understanding. If somebody comes along and says, that's wrong, then they go, that's really quite a severe thing for the brain to deal with, because it's not just like, you know, your understanding is wrong, but this, this model of the, the world you have in your head, it guides everything you do. It inf inf informs all your behavior, all your decisions, all your expectations. So for that to be wrong is a massive loss. You know, it's, a, it's a serious problem. And our brain doesn't like that. So it sort of tries to reject it or tries to force it out. I mean, ideally, in most cases, they go, okay, so I'm, you know, I was wrong about that, but I can still update my mental model of the world to include this new thing, which said I was wrong. And now I'll just you know, use that as well when I make decisions and plan things in future. But sometimes, you know, it's something you particularly rely on. Like, you know, if you're a deeply religious person, like your faith will inform a lot of what you think and do and, you know, act and your, your actions and your behaviors and if someone comes along and tells you that your faith is wrong you it is all incorrect you have been lied to that is deeply uncomfortable to have to try and take that into account because like well everything i've done so far has been based on the assumption that this the faith i have is correct is true to tell me otherwise is a massive blow to just how my very identity my existence and i can't really afford that uh, and, and this is all subconscious but your brain goes no that's not true you're wrong and you're trying to find reasons why the other person is wrong like if you can't attack the information you attack where it came from it's, oh, well you would say that because you read this newspaper you watch this channel and that's why you can't be trusted um yeah so the, our, brain, our brain is always very defensive when it comes to uh protecting our understanding of how things work around us but yeah so all these things we experience inform this and all the experiences you have are informed by the wider world so you know, that's where you have people in certain cultures and climates grown up and believe in certain things about the world or behaving in certain ways and people from different cultures do something very different and they often like this friction if they get together because both of them are using a worldview which is not compatible with the other person's and 
then you know, then disputes occur. Yeah. So um, I mean, I think we we need this property more for science because science is the 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 method where you need to correct yourself if you if your hypothesis mm. is wrong or if your concept is wrong, um, etc. And then the important thing for humanity is, um, or even like to understand for us, what is the, or what is the importance of brain is in terms of intelligence, especially when we are talking about human life, right? We, or mm. when we say that we are, uh, we are looking for intelligent life elsewhere, it's, it seems like we consider ourselves like humans intelligent, right? So hmm. where do we stand on that? Um, do we understand intelligence now? Uh, I mean, I remember this evolutionary based uh, definition, which is just this problem solving skill. So if, hmm. we, if we call uh, intelligence that, um, wh what about that? So um, yeah, but I think it's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of cliches around saying, oh, well, the animals are smarter than us because they never do this. They never have walls. They never have, the, the, but that's, a very reductionist argument and it's a very very negative um slant a very you know, unfair one on human intelligence but i mean by and large there's ample evidence shows we are the most intelligent species because we can do all the things we do we can have this rich internal existence and this you know, we can convey information verbally to other people and uh, other species really struggle to do that in all of them you know some you know, whale songs elephants they have rich communication and things like that but um yeah, I think it's sentient self-awareness, which people throw in as the, the apex of this particular intelligence tree at the moment. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's a tricky one to sort of pin down what exactly intelligence is, because, you know, again, it's, it's, if it's, for us, it's the result of the brain doing many, many different things. And because it's an intangible property, you know, there's lots of argument as to what it actually is. I mean, like people say like IQ tests measure intelligence, but... A lot of scientists think, well, they're not really that useful because they don't really tell us what, how smart someone is. They just tell us how someone's how smart someone is relative to the rest of the population. So, like, you know, if it, there's this range of intelligence, you're here, but that doesn't you know, that doesn't tell you what they're capable of or what they can do or what they uh, what they know. And yeah, so like, there's, some people make the difference between sort of knowledge and intelligence. And like knowledge is more stored information. You can have access to all. The information you you want in your head there's people who do like quizzes and uh, professional professional quiz people they have countless countless uh, facts and data data examples and questions and trivia in their head but it doesn't necessarily mean they're intelligent and this means they have access to a great wealth of information the ability to use that the ability to formulate it and put it together in new ways and create things that would be a more fluid intelligence as we as we sort of recognize it uh, but yeah so it, it really is hard to pin down exactly what intelligence is um in terms of like you know capacity to use it i think humans do still win that one because we can do so much stuff but uh if you want like sort of a, a robust definition of intelligence that everyone agrees on we don't really have one of those yet because it is just um, you know there's so many variables to it and you know, this it has been one thing which everyone's finally agrees with. So, right, that's intelligence. Where do we go from here? It seems to be still a sort of a topic for much debate. But if we again uh, take our an analogy uh, with the algorithm part, so if brain is an algorithm, then uh, won't it be just simply this uh, this kind of self correcting property because. I mean, if you can, if there is an algorithm or there are, let's say if there are different versions of algorithm and the one which can correct itself would be kind of far better in, in terms of predicting um, the reality, right? Well, yeah, I think that's a big part of, um, so how the brain works and it is, you know, it, it updates. I think the whole flexibility thing means that our brain takes in new information and uses that uh, to inform its decisions later on. Um, except in cases where you know the information is too disruptive to our existing systems so like the algorithm says like, that's not compatible I can't I can't operate with that layer so I'm gonna have to ignore that or you know, work around it somehow so yeah there, there's a big part of that I mean that's a, that's one of the more you know that's why the brains are so powerful and they have this ability to self recognize self monitor and self correct and you know, a brain that can't do that isn't a useful brain at all so yeah that's very much you know, that's I mean, that's very much um, 
how we operate. I guess you could say humans do that better than anyone. We can take in more information and change our approach to things based on this update information better than most species. And therefore, that's why we are you know, the dominant ones that we are. And that's why humans also have this anti-intellectualism. Uh, that mm. was interesting for me to read because, um, I mean, of course, you can you can observe that. And, and of course, here uh, we are not discussing all the puns that you have included in, in the book, which I think people should read and then they, they'll, they'll find them. So, so what is the deal with uh, anti-intellectualism? Yeah, that's um, a big combination of things, but it's always been around in some shape or form. Uh, it's like, it's people don't like things. They don't understand. So like we have, we would like to think we have an intact model of how the world works. Then we can update it, we can tweak it, we can find new things and stuff. But if something is beyond our understanding, something beyond like, well, I don't have the mental capacity to grasp that, to understand it. Therefore, it's an uncertain thing. And it's, um, it's therefore a stressful thing because I don't, I don't know what it is. Um, because in my latest book, which I haven't published yet, so but it's um, you know, to talk about something like a lot of the great philosophers and intellects of the past were motivated by anxiety. Because like, like, like I don't understand how the universe works, and I need to know because it's you know, it, it scares me that I don't know. And that's where you get the great discoveries from people who are like, "Oh, just I need to have this. I got to get to the bottom of this." Um, that's you know that's one approach. But then when people have you know if you're in the wider world and like you function normally as a human like oh, my life is fine i can i can hold on the job i've got a family and things i'm doing well and someone comes along and says ah oh, but this thing big confusing uh complicated thing is important then you know it's unsettling for several things like because you first we say well i don't understand that and i don't like not understanding that and i can either try and understand it which involves a lot of effort and time and change in my own internal the uh, internal worldview, or I can reject it. And they're like, no, I don't want that. I don't need that. And it shouldn't be there, which allows you to keep everything intact and, and you know, go about your way. Uh, so when people have, um, you know, bring out uh, things which are complicated and confusing, you you, know, it, you will get people to attack the source. So they're like, well, no, stop doing that because I don't like that because it confuses me when this happens. And again, it's an ego superiority thing too, as in if you, know, you understand this thing and I don't, and that is, I mean, that in, in in a sense, that makes you better than me. But I, but that you're not, because you know, you're you're a nerd, you're intellectual, you're a you're a SWAT, you're a geek. You know, it's very much um, you know, turn the the positive or turn like the superior thing into a negative thing. Yeah, I, I bet you don't do this. I bet you don't have a girlfriend. I bet, you know, it's very much um, you know, it's a defense mechanism to say like you're doing something I don't understand, and rather than accept that and accept that you are better than, than I am. I'm going to diminish you. I'm going to reduce you by you know, convincing myself and those around me that you are a flawed for doing this. You know, it's a, you're not a superior status. You're a lower status because you do that sort of stuff, which is stupid. You know, it's um, it's pointless. You're wasting time and anything and like that. So yeah, it's a lot of it's going to be a very strong defense mechanism to, to say like you know, to be introduced to concepts that you don't understand and don't want to put the effort into understanding. So yeah, there's lots of reasons why the intellectualism thing comes up by a, by these classic behaviors but that doesn't mean that if a person wants he or she can't learn it plasticity is still there you can learn mm -hmm. it it's just that probably you don't want to spend the energy to kind of learn it and you know um, talk about yeah. it and stuff right yeah totally it's like it's a it's going to be a personal variable as well and you don't everyone who's anti-intellectual anti is cognitively capable of understanding the thing they are rejecting but the reason they're rejecting it is because like they, they don't want to uh, it, uh, they, don't have, they don't have the motivation to to, to, to to put the effort in to doing so uh or like it's part, part part of their group identity or part of their identity or their cultural identity to reject that thing you know like obviously back in so much of history like the, the established church was threatened by science because like well if you're when you say this that undermines our core belief which gives us our power and control so we must suppress that. We must stop that happening. We must stop you from doing this, even if you are right. Because you know, in terms of practical effects, it just means that we lose stuff and we don't want that. Um, but everyone who's you know said those things had the capability of understanding. I don't think there's any particular person who is more capable than anyone else of grasping such concepts. It's just that so many some people are 
inclined to put the work in or to, you know, to, to, to make those mental leaps to get to the understanding of a complex thing. And not everyone is uh, for various reasons, but it doesn't mean they lack the ability. Yeah. So, so, so far we have discussed many things that, I mean, of course, all the humans, we, we think that we have our perfect brain and whatever we learn and think it's the best in the world, but what we have discussed that where our brains lack and um, the, the next thing is, uh, which is my favorite, my personal favorite is uh, illusion. Mm. So why do we get these illusions? Well, I think it's important to remember that um, our senses aren't perfect for a start. I mean, the, 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 the amount of information that is out there in, in the world around us at any given moment is just substantial. You know, the, the color of everything, the size of everything, the shape of everything, every single square inch of surface on something that it all has lots of information in it and we can't take it all in and remember it all this is simply impossible so our brain is very much um you know our, our eyesight and our focus is kind of narrow and our brain fills in the gaps on it so like you know uh, we have two streams of information from the ears and eyes and touch and stuff and our brain does a lot of work to turn that raw data into a uh, rich sensory experience or perception that we see around us uh, the world that we live in but because the brains do a lot of the heavy work in terms of turning crude sensory data into a rich perception it does a lot of guesswork it does a lot of um, extrapolation and assumption and some of the times these assumptions will be wrong or there will be uh, things which are sort of impossible for, for the brain to handle like i think i mentioned about the illusion like the whole uh, two-faced look at a vase or the cube, it keeps going up and down. One thing the brain really doesn't like is ambiguity, uncertainty. Because like, like I say, with the whole, like with the travel sickness thing, the brain doesn't like to look at a thing or something and says, that's not possible. That cannot be both things at the same time. So it has to be one or the other. And it imposes like a viewpoint on that. Uh, I think a few years back, we had the internet sensation, like is that a gold and black dress or is it a white and blue dress? Like it was the same dress and different lighting. But it can't be both. It can't be both at the same time. And some people's brains goes, no, it's white and blue. Some people's brains says, no, gold and black. <clears throat> and you know, that, that's where the arguments come from, because it's so ambiguous. It's such right on the, the cusp of the sensory range where it comes down to what your brain, you know, it's usually a coin toss. Like your brain goes, ah, it's blue or it's gold. And you know, that can happen a lot of things. Um, because a lot of time the brain is just doing all the hard work in creating our perception. And it'll sometimes create things which aren't really there in order to fill in gaps or to explain ambiguous stuff. So yeah, so like a lot of time, it, that's where illusions come from. It's in like your brain's looked at something and goes, that that those that can't be right. And it tries to impose like an interpretation on it, and uh, it doesn't happen. You know, like, I mean, it's not really there. Like you know, you can, you can even have auditory hallucinations where like a certain rhythm sounds like it's speeding up every time it repeats, but it's not. It just sounds like it is because your brain's going, okay, that's. That's a sound that speeds up, right? Yeah, that's a sound of something speeding up, but it's not. But it's your brain interpreting it that way because that's what it's got to work with. So, yeah, so when our brain extrapolates too much from what our senses are telling it and arrives at wrong conclusions, then we get hallucinations, um, uh, sorry, illusions and things like that. I think it's worth to, to mention that uh, why these things happen. One, one of the reasons is also the, the fact brain is not uh, kind of a micromanager right it just takes the takes all the information at the kind of more surface level and try to interpret it yeah no, the brain doesn't really do a deep dive on stuff because it doesn't have the time like it's because our senses are constantly telling our brain things you know, every second we're awake looking around like it's more stuff coming in more stuff coming in and the brain's like okay i'll just take what i need from this little bit and then uh keep looking at stuff and like oh, no i gotta i'll just take this i'll focus on this so you know it's um you know it, it's kind of surface level in that regard yes the brain is just sort of okay uh out of everything i'm looking at right now anything i'm perceiving or you know, anything i'm sensing what's important and it'll you know make decisions based on this the situation the circumstance what you're currently feeling what your current goals are and things like that but yeah it, it, it's very much um uh seat of the pants it's like yeah, it's just going moment to moment like what's important now what's important now what's important now what's important now and it doesn't sort of sift through anything in specifics and details it uh, just like goes right i've got the basic systems i'm just going to i'm going to interact with the world as best i can and um present the best perception i can come up with uh based on what's in front of me and you know 
most of the time does a really good job of that, but sometimes it you know, things get away from it. And that what's important now part is the attention. So in my case, like since I've been doing these conversations, and sometimes uh, you know the conversations are like a couple of hours long. Mm-hmm. And then some people they will come and they'll be like, "Oh, this was a long conversation, etc." Right? So, uh, what's the deal with the attention? Why we have like these kind of really short attention spans? Yeah, well, it's like, it's, it's another artifact of uh, the brain's limited uh, capacity in terms of pure physical resources and capabilities. Like I say, there's far too much going on in the world around us than we can ever hope to take in at once, and that's happening all the time. So our brain has evolved uh, the ability to pick and choose very specifically. And, you know, the, the, the ability to hold thoughts in your head is impressive, uh, but it's also kind of demanding. So to be able to, to bounce ideas around the knowledge in your head and things like that. So you need a sort of a very specific focus of attention. You can't just like pay attention to anything at once. You need to be able to narrow it. And it's, you know, it's quite a narrow range. I can look up you know, this conversation and that thing over there, but I can't do more than two or three things at the same time. I just believe that your attention is bouncing from one to the other constantly, quite rapidly. So it feels like you're doing two things at once, but you're doing two things at once, not as well as you would be doing one thing at a time. <clears throat> and you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's as narrow as it is, because it has to be. And that's basically what our brain can cope with, or at least what it's evolved to cope with. And you know, if it was, if you could handle more, you probably would have more uh, in terms of like, evolution. Goes, well, that's better if you, this particular variant of the species can pay attention to five things at once and they're going to win. They're going to outcompete the others because they obviously dominate them, but that hasn't happened or that didn't happen. So, you know, but also the ability to, things we're paying attention to, uh, the ability to sort of remember them uh, any from moment to moment is dependent on our short-term memory system, which takes place in the frontal lobes, but it's, you know, it's sort of like bouncing activity around to represent these things and it doesn't have much capacity long-term memory does it has a lot much 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 larger capacity than most things because it involves the formation of new brain cell connections uh but short-term memory doesn't do that as far as we're, we're away it's more of just certain patterns of activity in existing brain cells and that's you know that's fine but it, it has a limited um uh you can't put much in it i think four things is what we're uh, um Think of the, the average amount is you can hold four like items in your short term, <coughs> in your short term memory uh, at any one time. <coughs> when something new comes in, something else has to be pushed out as a result of that. So, so we have um yeah, just like purely because it's almost like laws of physics that you know, our brain does the best it can, but you know, the, the laws of nature, the laws of biology say okay, you can handle this much and no more, and do what you can with that. So the brain has come up with lots of different workarounds and ways of you know, making the most of that information, but it's still be limited at the end of the day. So with the multitasking part, um, it's interesting to kind of also ask, because there are certain processes where we don't have to take care of. Uh, one example would be eating or, you know, like, or, hmm. or uh, simply digesting the food, which we, we are not aware of those processes in general, right? And hmm. at that process, if you are reading or whatever you are doing, it's fine. So, is it possible that certain activities that you are doing in routinely, like it can be kind of walking, you know, and mm. where you know the path and if you are kind of reading or listening around that time, which is completely fine, but then there, there can be activities which are new to you and basically you shouldn't kind of multitask. Yeah, yeah, it happens quite a lot. Like if um, in things like you know, people like you know, when they start, when they, when they learn to drive. The first time you learn to drive, it's very, almost a very stressful experience because you're just constantly aware of what you're doing and you're very, um, very sensitive to any sort of change in your environment. Uh, but over time, you become more and more used to it, and you just well, you can do it without thinking. You can like drive for hours and go, oh, "I'm here now," and you haven't really thought about it. And um, because when something becomes familiar, I mean, like a familiar routine, familiar activity, familiar action. It becomes sort of like an implicit memory, so like the, the subconscious parts of your brain thinking, right, okay, this is very familiar now. I can take care of this. I don't need, you don't need the, the primary attention, which is really important and is uh, largely for novel things. It's like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. I haven't done all this before. Let's make this decision. The things that are predictable and familiar and routine, the subconscious parts of the brain can then take over those because we, you know, 
we don't need our conscious brain involved in the process. So you can like walk from one place to another if you do it every day without even realizing or even being or even thinking it's happening. And you know, I wouldn't have much memory of it either because you can you've been focused on something else, like listening to a podcast or um, you know, um, reading a book or whatever, whatever you're doing. So yeah, like when something becomes very familiar and very reliable, our subconscious brain is, is comfortable enough to just take over it. So it's been shunted down to the the autonomic systems, the automatic stuff. And okay, you you handle that. I'll take care of the the unexpected things or the, or the novel challenges we face. Whereas this is this, we, we, we're very aware of how this works now. So um, you guys down you know, downstairs can take care of it. Yeah, uh, let's switch the gears a little bit and and talk about personalities. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, different people they have different personalities, and um, this again comes from the uh, from our experience from the plastic plasticity of the brain that that we were talking about. So, I mean, I have done a few conversations on the topic, especially about nature nurture uh, kind of thing. Uh, but for me, uh, or the question that I wanted to ask was the, so what are the tools to measure these kind of personalities? Uh, if, we, if we can kind of outline that. Um, it's, a, it's a very tricky one to sort of pin down someone's personality because it's very much one of those things which is uh, very subjective and it's not exactly a tangible thing. Like you can't weigh someone's personality. You can't see how tall it is. It's not, um, no, it's not a physical thing. It's, uh, it's, it's almost one of those things that people sort of understand uh, implicitly, but they don't actually you ask them to define the personality, they would struggle. And that's sort of reflected in the scientific literature too, because there are you know, lots of data about uh, the specific uh, traits people have, which are indicative of a certain personality and trying to categorize them into, you know, there's the big five personality and uh, or like the, the classic introvert, extrovert personalities. And, you know, the, a lot of it's um, self-assessment, as in, like, people all fill in forms saying, okay, how do you feel about these things? Sort of like a, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, like, 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 don't like that. And that is, an, okay, so they like these things, but don't like these things, then that would put them in this category of personality, whereas if they like doing this and don't like doing that, they're in this category. And it's fairly, you know, it's fairly straightforward all the time, but it is still scientifically and psychologically uh, probably overly simplistic. And I think most of the researchers do agree with that because like, what would form a human personality, a lot of it you can't just uh, work out with a test or you know, multiple choice questions <clears throat> because a lot of it is intangible. You know? like, there's lots of uh, traits people have which don't, uh, aren't outwardly expressed. Like if someone like, you know, is, um, uh, is sort of kind of slightly overly cautious with money, Unless you see them buying things, and they might never come across. You, know, you see them, you know, in a social situation, or you see them in work. You don't know that about them. You just know that they're a, you know, a brash person, or perhaps you just know something else about them. So there are plenty of personality traits which are really hard to identify or recognize because they're not outwardly expressed. You know, what if someone just like a really big fan of ducks or something? You know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting trait, but. Unless you actively expressed out loud, you will never be aware of that. It's just funny, you know, it's still in form as part of their personality. So, yeah, there's lots of different um, uh, angles on it. And it, it will be informed, like you say, like a lot of, uh, like pretty much everything that makes us that makes us what we are. There'll be genetic components, like some people are more prone to thrill seeking because they, the reward pathway has a certain lack or excess of a certain transmitter, which means they respond more to... Uh, stimulation of the scary sort, perhaps, and you know that'll give that'll that'll help shape the whole personality. But uh, it won't it won't be the only factor. So yeah, there's just so much going on with any one person's personality that it's really hard to pin down you know, one specific thing that it would be. But then would be able to um, to kind of um, narrow down certain areas of the brain that okay we can say that okay these are the certain areas that they light up when certain situation happens and then kind of we start comparing different people i think people are already doing it it's just that whether or how far we can take that uh, those kind of studies uh, in terms of personalities yeah <clears throat> so like those kind of studies are very common and they're actually becoming more common because like a lot of commercial interests are getting involved with them but they are always be taken with a certain sort of you know with a pinch of salt, as they say, or take it at certain arm's length, because what lights up 
in your brain doing a brain scanner uh, is nowhere near as clear and straightforward as most people seem to think it is. Uh, like in my first, in my second book, I mentioned my conversation with Professor Chris Chambers, who does a lot of brain scanning. He said when they were first invented, you brought in the area of blobology, as they called it, because for someone in a scanner, show them something, and a blob shows up in the scanner. Says, yep, that's the part of the brain responsible for this thing, like with playing chess or listening to certain music and stuff. But anyway, it, it's not that straightforward because. You can say to someone like, oh, if you stimulate them in a certain way, like make them do this particular puzzle and parts of their brain light up. And then you, a lot of people might say, oh, that's the puzzle part of the brain. But it, it's not. That's just the part of the brain that they are using to engage with the puzzle in this particular instance. But well, that could be anything. Like, what if that part of the brain is responding to what the picture of the puzzle is? What if it's responding to the background noise of the scanner? What if they're um, thinking about the memories they have which are related to the stimulation which the puzzle is evoking? What if it's like they're spatial awareness uh part of the brain because it's you know, it's, a, it's a 3d puzzle or what if it's uh, you know connected to a, you know, a sister you don't really like who always did loads of puzzles and laughed at you because you couldn't do them so you don't know what that person is thinking really uh in terms of what you know, what what part of the brain they're really using to deal with this thing in front of them and that's you know that's uh, that makes it a lot more complicated that's why brain scanning is so much more uh complex than people give it credit for. There's a lot of number crunching and sifting through the activity data and see what's going on in there. So, you know, but that's, it's not, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means the more basic something is, the more reliable uh, or more fundamental something is, the more reliable a brain scanner is. Like we're very, we're very confident that uh, the hippocampus is involved with memory because as well as lesion studies, if you make someone recall a memory in a brain scanner, then those parts of the brain reliably light up, you know, like the hippocampus, frontal lobes, and things like that. Or if you show them like a, just a blank wall of a certain color, you will get activity in the occipital lobes, which is the visual cortex. So we know that bit is involved with vision, at least, because that's the only thing it can be. But when something like personality, you know, when something gives a personality test, like there's so much going on, uh, so many different parts of the brain are involved in it, that you won't... Um, uh, you, you're very, very hard to pin it down to one particular area. Probably get you know, like whole network lighting up, and it's really impossible then to say what bit of each network is doing what. But you, you know the network's involved, but that doesn't mean that you have any further clarity in what what exactly a personality is in terms of brain functioning. Yeah, but um, so let's put it in this way. I mean, um, as a neuroscientist and also as a comedian, uh, would you be able to look at uh, people's brain and understand if your joke, if your joke, or the, the the if there is any kind of humor part in the mm -hmm. brain uh, that if it lights up, you can understand that okay, this joke worked better than the the previous one, something like that. Um, people have tried to do that. There have been some uh, fair few scanning studies into trying to sort of pin down what's happening in the brain when someone experiences humor uh, and laugh uh, and laughs. But um, again, it's, I think laughter seems to come largely for the brainstem because it's such a fundamental reflex. You know, it's the whole reptile part of the brain, like the whole lung spasms, that's so like the actual act of laughing is uh, kind of reasonably well understood because it's, you know, it's fairly straightforward in that respect, you know, so, but the, the where in the brain humor exists is a whole other matter because like what, triggered this laughter what part of the brain suddenly went oh that's funny is uh, it's, it's it's kind of hard to pin down because the human brain is so good at that it's so like efficient at recognizing humor and laughing the process seems to happen faster than our best scanners can keep up with and that's you know, it's, it's impressive it's it's good that, you know, that we can do that but it means that it's almost like a technological limit and there's some data which sort of pins it down to sort of like the the, the junction between occipital, temporal, and parietal lobes where language and memory and thinking all happen. And that's sort of like, basically sort of like this part of the brain would be sharing information from all the other parts of the brain. Because human often involves that. It's like, you need to have how you know the world works and how you think the world should work and put it all together. And so, oh, that's not how it works. That's a funny thing. And then sort of making that judgment. Uh, so I think it's in that area somewhere, but is it, you know, you can't, can't really be more specific than that. So, yes, people are trying to pin down where humor comes from in the brain using scanners, and they sort of got a rough ballpark idea. But 
because the human brain is so good at humor, it's proven difficult to really be specific about it. Yeah, and the and the fact that there are many things involved, like language, as you mentioned, and but mm. but apart from that, it's also the um, you know the facial uh, expressions, the visual signals, and uh, um, the kind of this being in that uh, what kind of environment you are in, right? Like if you are there with with the friends or family, I think it'll be easier to yes, totally, yeah. Uh, yeah. So so that kind of part. So, um, I mean, humans are social animals and, um, but with the modern world, we are kind of being more isolated. What happened uh, with the pandemic? That's another thing. Hmm. So what are the consequences? Of isolation? Uh, of the isolation. Yeah. Well, we, we don't react well to isolation. Humans, like I say, are social species. We are, in many people's view, the most social species. We've been labeled ultra social by a lot of scientists. Because other people just uh, are such a big part of our our mental existence, and most of our ideas about who we are and what we're capable of and what our worth is come from our interactions with other people, and that's you know that can't be overstated. And things like you know we have emotions like guilt, like embarrassment, which only exist in the context of how other people feel and re react towards us. So like a big part of our brain is dedicated to socialization, to social interaction, to relationships, to forming connections with other people and recognizing them and like empathy and things like that. So, so many neurological processes which are responsible and dedicated to that sort of thing. Uh, but so like when we're deprived of other people, of human contact, big part of our brain is sort of being starved of the information and the rewards it needs to, to function properly. So it is really stressful. Like, you know, I've said it many times in many places, but um, as a uh, solitary confinement you know, being deliberately kept away from all human contact is a recognized form of torture. Humans just cannot handle that. They find it deeply, deeply, deeply distressing and psychologically harmful and painful because so much of our world, or as we understand it, involves the contributions of other people and like how they perceive it too. So yeah, so we we you know that that's one reason why I think we will have seen a lot of um, uh, spikes in mental health issues during and after the pandemic because the lockdowns meant people were kept apart and people weren't able to interact like they were like they used to like they expect. And when the human brain cannot interact with others, it suffers. It it sort of cannot work like it should, and therefore we get. Um, problems and issues like that. Yeah, so there are a host of uh, issues here, uh, which of course we won't be able to cover today, but the, the the crux of the matter is that social life is important for humans mm. uh, to be, to kind of stay well uh, mentally. The, the, the question remains, what is that mental illness, which I think again, we don't know much about it. And um, it's it's quite different than the physical illness because you know we have kind of those phenotypes we have kind of uh, markers of uh, these kind the, these kind of physical illness which we are not aware yet uh, really of the of the mental illness right uh, yes so one of the main issues with the um, the equivalent people equate mental health to physical health problems. A lot because it it's it's useful to help in understanding it, that people who are um, uh, you know mentally unwell often don't get the same level of uh, consideration or sympathy or just acknowledgement that someone who is physically uh, unwell will get because their condition is it's usually visible. You can see like oh your leg is broken, you are you have a virus, you have a tumor, you have a disease, whatever it is. So, you know, when people say mental health problems are just like physical ones, they usually mean they are as debilitating and are as serious and should be taken as seriously as physical ones, which I totally understand and agree with and relate to. But you say there are some notable differences between mental and physical health problems, which should also be recognized in that, uh, you know, mental health problems are harder to pin down a lot because they don't have a physical presence. You know, the human body is consistent. You know, we know lungs should be, we know how they should work, we know what our bones should look like, you know, our structure, our physical shape. We know, no, it's, it's established. So when someone has like too rapid a heartbeat or someone has too high a temperature, we know because it's, 
it's different to the human norm. But the human mental norms are you know, far more vague and plastic and changeable. And as a result, so it's really hard to pin down when someone is mentally different from everyone else to the point where they're unwell. Uh, so you have to use like social norms and social averages and sort of you know, take into account how everyone else behaves. But people, you know, society's behavior changes over time. So, and what people believe and think, and that, uh, that changes as societies develop and evolve. And therefore our definition of mental health problems has to change with it because you know, the, the norms that we used to, for example, like assess mental health problems with from the 1950s are very different now. They don't apply anymore. I think in my fourth book, I mentioned that um, homosexuality was a recognized mental illness for a very long time. And now it's not. Now it's, uh, you know, same-sex marriage is increasingly common. It's definitely not recognized as an illness. It's just a typical expression of human sexuality, which is very fluid and complex in its own right. But, you know, that at the time, that was believed. It was because, like, well, homosexuality is wrong. No one does that. That's, that's a deviation from the norm. Uh, but now it is the norm, so it's not a mental health problem anymore. And there are many people sort of flag up that what else do we have now that is considered a mental health problem that perhaps wouldn't be in a more developed and sort of forward-thinking society in like 50 years' time. So, yeah, so there are lots of different um, uh, issues with mental health problems that don't uh, sort of have the straightforward uh, equivalent with physical health issues. Yeah, and since, I mean, the fact that, again, humans are a social um, species, um, and that's why the importance of self-image, basically, because that's what we at least understand, that self-image or the role of self-image kind of plays an important role in mental illness, right? That the... Hmm. It can, it can be that we are behaving in certain way. And then of course we get a lot of pushback from the society and that just leads up in, in, in some sort of uh, mental illness. Right. Yes. Because we have to, like I said, you know, we have to, the all egocentric thing is we need to feel valuable. We need to feel, uh, if not looked up to, we need to feel we can be, or should be looked up to. We need to have other people's good regard in order to, be mentally well in order to sustain ourselves as individual thinking beings and if you don't have that if you are too anxious in order to interact with others or if you're too depressed in order to you know, think you have any sort of valuable contribution to make to the world around you it is very debilitating it's extremely incapacitating because first and foremost your brain needs to have some sort of motivation to do anything to do anything at all and if a mental illness robs you of that then you can't do much, you know, you may be physically capable of moving, but if you're not mentally capable of doing anything, then you won't do it because you are, like I say, mentally incapable. Just because the physical capacity still exists doesn't mean that you can access it. And yeah, so other people's good regard is a big part of you know, our own sense of self-worth. We need to have it validated by other people because we are such a social species. And when we lose that, so like if we are, an outcast if we are rejected by the people it is genuinely psychologically damaging because you know that's a vital part of human existence the being accepted and at least liked by other people to a certain degree or certain other people and when we don't have that then you know, our brains struggle to to do what they need to do in order to function properly the other um, issue would be which is i think quite surprising the the fact that us a patient can then opt for suicide, like to kill itself or himself or herself rather than kind of, um, because this is, this is really difficult to digest, you know, how th this kind of tendency would de develop. And then also like from evolutionary point of view. So what's your take on that? Yes. The whole suicide thing is very, um, very uh, objectively uh, unusual, isn't it? That the idea that an individual could end their own life by uh, make the decision to do so, which clearly would uh, sort of go against billions of years of survival instinct and things like that. But um, I think it sort of comes from the perspective of when you're in that sort of mental state, you don't see it as, you know, um, I don't want to die. I don't want to, you know, it's, it it's genuinely feels like the, the best option in that your sense of self-worth has been so inverted. I've been so contaminated by the health condition, whatever it is, that you know, it, it seems like the lesser of two evils. Like I could either carry on living 
which I'm just finding incredibly painful, incredibly stressful and incredibly unpleasant. And I am making other people's lives worse by existing. Because people who commit suicide by things like depression genuinely believe that. They won't think, well, you know, it's, it's, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to anyway. It's like they think it's the best course of action because they, their sense of self-worth has been so corroded and it's been inverted to like a sense of self-loathing, sense of I have no purpose, I have no function. The only good thing I can do now is to remove myself from this world in order to let it function better because you know, I'm, when I'm in it, it's being compromised by my, by my existence. And it's weird that we can get that point. It's weird that you know, any typical brain, like I say, all those countless eons of survival instinct ingrained can do that. But that's sort of arguably the power of the human brain. It has the ability to rationalize and uh, approach things from certain angles. And it can, you know, we are self-aware to the point we, we, we can change our basic instincts so we can master them. And most of the time that's good, you know, because we don't behave like animals. We don't uh, you know, just rely on our base instincts, but sometimes that can go too far. And therefore, like, it can overrule our survival instincts and say, no, like, my, my existence is a net negative. I, I, if, I, if I remove myself from the world, then I would improve it. And that's the best course of action. And then you end up with people dying by suicide. And that's, um, you know, it's terribly sad, terribly bleak, but it's something the brain is capable of, uh, which is not good, but it is what it is. Yeah, it it is really unfortunate. So, I mean, of course, we we can't um, we are not talk, talking here um, in terms of medical point of view, but um, still, like, if you want to give any message to to the people who are going through that phase, and also to society, to humanity, <laughs> so what's what's what that message would be that you know how we can improve our understanding of uh, mental illness and also kind of being more um, generous, you know, kind to the people simply yes. that they can um, mm. help each other. And there are lots of things that you know, can be said, like if you're talking to people who are going through issues and problems of their own right now, um, it's easy to say things like, oh, there is help out there. You can uh, you can you know, reach out and speak to people, but these are these are becoming rather trite sound bites because in many people's cases, there may be help available, but it's not the help they need. And you know, taking that extra step to ask for help is a big deal when you're in the grip of a serious mental health problem. And you know, it's not what you can say to that, but you know, you can say like what I would say is that you, what you're going through is real, it's valid, and other people dismissing it doesn't make it the case. And that is, you know, if anything, just to accept that you are, that you're in a very bad place and things that this is happening to you is an important first step on, on the road to doing something about it. Because so much, uh, you know, invo- is about denial. So like, no, no, I'm fine. I'll be okay. Um, I can handle this. I can deal with this. I'm, I'm not going to be mentally compromised because there's such a stigma around it still. Uh, so to be able to say, I am not well, I am genuinely struggling here, is something you should allow yourself to do. You should be able to say to yourself, I'm clearly not well, and I don't want to be like this. Uh, you know, so it, once you can convince yourself of that, or once you accept it yourself, then perhaps, and hopefully, accepting help or finding help will come, become easier. Um, for people who are like not uh, in the grips of a serious health problem, mental health problem, but you know, how to avoid that. I think because uh, of what I've written in recent years, a lot of it comes down to emotion and particularly in the wake of the pandemic. There is still, especially in Western worlds, this tendency to prioritize happiness, to only want to be happy. Like this assumption that you should be happy all the time. If you're not, then something is wrong. And that isn't how it works. Now, happiness is a good thing. We should strive for it. And perhaps, you know, it's good to be happy on average. Uh, taking a, you know, live for 10 years, most of that time should be happy than not. And that's great. But uh, that shouldn't come at the, uh, as a result of suppressing other emotions, but the negative ones, because the negative emotions are just as valid as the positive ones. They're an important part of how your brain deals with things. So we still have a tendency, especially men do, to suppress our emotions, particularly the ones we don't like. Uh, but that's not how your brain works. You need to experience them. You need to acknowledge them and accept them in order for your brain to sort of put them in place, to clear them out, and then you can carry on your life. 
the denial of emotions, the suppression and avoidance of emotions. Uh, so it's like you know, it's like your brain not getting the workouts. So it's like becoming sedentary. It makes it harder for the brain to deal with those emotions when they pop up later down the line and something bad really does happen. So yeah, so be aware of your emotions and don't try and suppress them. Uh, but obviously, in some cases it'll be necessary, but at least accept that they happen, acknowledge them, and you know, don't try and deny them. That's you know, a, a useful tip for better mental health. Yeah, I think that's a great message. Um, the other, the also, also the other thing is that uh, maybe from uh, from social media or something, we we kind of pick pick up this message that you know, uh, world is changing. There are mean people out there, etc. But the the fact is, there are a lot of kind people, uh, mm. generous people around us. It's just I think we just need to go and talk to them. That's that's the, that's it. If you can, yes, um, that's the start. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so what what's what about your next book? So you were talking uh, talking about uh, mm. about it a little bit in in between the conversation, but yes. I left the question for the end. Mm. Cool, so yeah. yeah, yeah, my next book's out in twenty twenty three. It's uh, called Emotional Ignorance, and it was going to be called Emotional Intelligence because right now about emotions and how they work. Then I started writing the book. I realized I don't know, and nobody else seems to either. They're very complex and not um, basic and straightforward like most people think. So. I changed the title to Emotional Ignorance. Um, but it's also it changed rapidly because it was, I started writing before the pandemic, but then the pandemic hit and my father caught COVID very early on and passed away from it. So I had to deal oh. with that, the fall of that um, in, in isolation during lockdown. So, you know, it, um, all I had was a head full of very, very powerful emotions and a, and a book to write about emotions. So I essentially, um, you know, I use my own grief uh, to, to channel uh, channel was what I was going through and um, you know, it was a very interesting experience from being a neuroscientist dealing with uh, intense emotions and being able to talk about them in the most sort of objective uh, analytical way so yeah I think it's a very very interesting outcome uh, you know, it's, a, it's it's part grief journal part uh, self-discovery part um, extrapolation of how emotions have shaped everything about us the whole world as we know it and um, yes hopefully people will find that interesting so it'll be out in January in the UK, um, other countries uh, to be confirmed, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it really sounds like another journey, you know, another interesting. Mm, uh, interesting so. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I hope, um, you know, people would connect uh, with, with, with your story again and, and let's see that how much we can learn because that's the interesting part about your job. I mean, it's, it's of course, information, science communication, a little bit of those puns, you know, mm. jokes mm. that you, that you add in your text. That's, that's great. Mm. Um, so with that, uh, thank you so much for accepting the invitation, uh, right. coming onto the podcast, sharing all the different uh, ideas, uh, your knowledge uh, to, to us or with us, to, to my listeners also, and um, all the best for your next book. Thank you, Rich. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you.